What is up everybody? Welcome back to yet another live stream episode number 69 Lamau to <laughs> of the Camera Junkie live stream. I had to throw that out there for Davey. So Welcome yet to another week, number 69 consecutive of the Camera Junkie Livestream. I thank you for being here as always and taking the time, your most precious commodity, and spending it here with me, Mr. Camera Junkie, on the live stream. If it is your first time, my name's Lewis, and I would love for you to say hello in the chat, introduce yourself so that the rest of the Camera Junkie crew could give you the warm welcome. And with that being said, as always, let me say what's up to the crew. Let's see who's here. Of course, we have Mr. Moderator, Paul Duncan, saying hello to the fam. Marine X saying what's up. Oh, he's got a question right off the bat. So he's, Okay, so let me get back to that. Uh, Mr. Duncan is also saying, warning, viewing, viewing this stream is at your own risk. Mr. Camera Junkie and his subsidiaries or his mods are not responsible for any negative impact on your net worth. This stream might cause gas, as also known as gear acquisition syndrome, but we will move on. What's up, Nano? How are you doing? He's here saying hello to everyone. Everyone's saying hello, as they always do, the fam. Mr. Sarkeesian, as always, thank you for stopping by. Mr. Jones, how are you doing this evening? Everybody's here, even K Wall. How are you doing? Saying hello to all the junkies. It says, Look who's got the blue wrench. Oh, of course, he is the master moderator. <laughs> he says, Yeah, I'm kind of everywhere. He does an amazing job, and I'm always, always extremely grateful for him taking the time and spending it here. Yep, and he says, If you got a question for me, Mr. Camera Junkie, always remember to put a cue in front of it so that it looks like this otherwise it's just a comment because the family's always talking to each other so um it looks like i got a couple of questions right off the bat so let me get into it it says i'm curious to know if the f4 on the 16 to 35 will be sufficient for the interval shooting indoors on an fx3 well i'm just gonna say yes it is and why it is, I'll get to in a little bit because it's kind of the secret sauce and it's not has nothing to do with the lens, has to do with your camera. So if you have the FX3, then yes, this lens will fit you perfectly or the Sony A7S3 for the same reason. Okay, and let me check that other question here. It says, um, Sony ZV-1, do I need a capture card to get 1080p on streaming platforms? Yes, you would have to either start using the, the USB as your power supply. So instead of getting a dummy battery, you would have the ability to charge your battery to prolong the battery of your camera or the power of your camera. The thing that you won't be doing is having it send the signal through the same cable. And because you're separating it and you're getting full high definition through one feed and power through the other, you will get the highest quality feed out of that camera to any platform, but you will need a capture card to do so. Okay, so yes. With that being said, okay, that's right off the bat. Let's get into it. Well, ooh, ooh, that was the wrong application. Let's just close you out completely. Come on. That's fine. All right. There we go. All right, some stats on this lens. So this is a announcement that Sony made of their new 16 to 35 F4 G lens. It's not a G master and it has to do with it being F4. They do not put anything like over 2.8 into the G master series, but the quality and the sharpness that you're going to get from this lens is pretty much on par with all of their G master lenses. If you were to stop them down to an F4 type of aperture, the reason why they decided to stay with the F4 has to do with the form factor. This is an amazing little power zoom lens. So the, more uh the power zoom that we're used to dealing with is either their 
kit lens, which is the 16 to 55, or their upgraded G lens, which is their 18 to 1. 105 I believe is the 18 to 105 on the APS-C side so it's been a while that we haven't seen a power zoom come out of the full frame lineup but one of their more popular lenses for the APS-C happens to be their 10 to 18 millimeter lens which doing the appropriate um, crop factor multiplication onto those numbers it will give you the equivalent of a 15 millimeter to 34 so it's within that same range the backdrop with that is that you are dealing with the APS-C size sensor some people prefer it some people not so much but when it comes to the cinema cameras that Sony is stepping their game up on the full frame is where they're putting you know their their monies or they're putting their chips in not only for their cinema cameras but the lines that they're seeking out in the future as far as their um, drone because I believe I spoke about it here previously it's called air peak and this is a full-size like industrial drone that you're gonna see in movies so it's also kind of designed to be able to that music just kicked up a little louder than the rest just bring that down okay so the air peak um drone is actually designed to house their fx3 camera that's why they made it into like such a square form factor and now you're going to have a 16 to 35 millimeter zoom lens so it's going to give you a very wide angle and a very compact form factor because this thing is very small especially when you compare it to 16 to 35 millimeter lenses in every other camera company this is pretty much the smallest that you can get now some of those bigger ones would be considered like the g master f 2.8 and a uh, faster aperture so to speak but at the same time the size really is a deterrent and when you're changing the focal length the lens or the element at the front really does extend changing the balance of weight on the lens so let's say you were using it on a drone which carries a gimbal or let's say you were just using a gimbal you would have to rebalance the camera every time you change the focal length from 16 to 35 because the elements inside of it are going to shift in weight throwing the entire gimbal off of the settings that you had that's why this lens is very um, it's, it's going to do very well in that market for the reason that you will be able to control the zoom while hypothetically this drone is in the air. So imagine that you had a drone up there and you wanted to zoom into 35 millimeters, but you sent it up at 16 millimeters wide. Traditionally, you would have to bring down that aircraft, change the focal length, rebalance, and then send it back up to get that shot. Now, with a controlled power zoom system through this air peak, you're going to be looking at the fact that you're going to have a like a rocker, like that you usually would like that you would see on an FX3, that zoom rocker, or something like I I just looked up because I have the A5100 that has the same zoom rocker setup. So having that zoom rocker on a controller down on the ground and you're saying, I want to zoom in while I'm up there, change no other settings and also know that you'd be able to power zoom the, the effect while the drone is in the air. Also know that you're not going to lose balance and stability because all of the elements have been designed to stay within the 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 lens itself so it never changes sizes so that it would lose balance on a gimbal this is a, a variety a variety of advantages that you can have with this lens some people might complain that it's not fast enough as far as aperture goes being that it is an f4 but in all sincerity when it comes to 
people who are vlogging that this might be suitable for and want a wide aperture lens on a full frame camera but don't want it to be as big as the lenses were before will definitely go to this and just like that 10 to 18 it is stuck on an f4 aperture and it's designed so that it can have all these other capabilities power zoom would not have been an option if this lens would have been any bit um like faster as far as the aperture goes because you wouldn't be able to fit all of the electronics that you have inside of it with the elements that you need to move around on top of that this has those xd linear like um, motors inside of the lens so all of the elements are going to be you know moving extremely fast being that it's going to keep up with sony's latest and greatest autofocus so this lens is going to give you a field of range view from 107 degrees to 62 so that's kind of like how wide you can go to how zoomed in you can do it and like i said if hypothetically you had it up in the in the air on a drone you wouldn't have to bring it down to be able to utilize that capability so th these are the things that you know when you hear about lens reviews you're you're not hearing because you're using you're hearing about them in the case scenario of a youtuber or a vlogger but these lenses are designed to cater to a wide assortment of um, applications including cinema so now it's something that i also had mentioned before the fx3 is considered to be sony's cinema camera but all of sony's other cinema cameras don't carry ibis which is the in-body stabilization that's why to me it's still more towards the hybrid side because when it comes to real cinema and it comes to what would i say um stabilization they're gonna do it most likely in post like the sony fx6 camera that has gyro stabilization allowing you to get gimbal like movements or gimbal like stabilization in your movements when you're shooting your foot um your footage all in post so having the sensor move for a cinema camera to me was not like the biggest thing but i also have to stand corrected because i happened to speak with um i believe it was rafael ludwig and i asked him what would you have preferred as a cinematographer which he is in the professional realm uh, would you prefer like variable nd inside of your camera or the ibis and he was like i'll throw a filter on front of my lens i want the ibis and i was like well, that, that's where I stand corrected, right? So in his use case scenario, he definitely prefers that in the FX3. Me, I, you know, from when they announced that camera, I thought that they would have been, if they would have put the variable ND instead of the IBIS, would have lent it more towards the cinema line. But I digress because at the end of the day, this camera is actually one of the secret sauces when it comes to this lens in particular. And now this is where I'm gonna answer um, the question about, is it sufficient for interval shooting for with the FX3? And yes, even though it's an F4 and F4 is not the greatest for indoor, first off, if you have enough light, you can handle it. But second, if you still want to get like a low light capability out of it that's where the secret sauce is in the camera itself and this is because the sony a7s3 and the fx3 both have dual dual native isos now to to get a little nerdy and, and try to explain this the iso is the sensitivity of your sensor you're always going to try to keep your iso as low as possible because when you have less light the sensor now has to compensate and you start pumping up the iso on your camera and as soon as you start pumping that up it will introduce what we call noise or grain which is where it starts looking real fuzzy because it's trying to like digitally you know like fill in and enhance light where there isn't any but with the dual native isos on these cameras once you reach 
12,500 on the ISO, it resets, which is the biggest thing on these cameras. Now, once you get to that point, I would tell you to start using that, that second native ISO as your native ISO because you're running on an F4. But using the 12,500 is going to get you an extremely clean image. It's going to be a boost in sensitivity on the sensor that's going to allow you to see almost like night vision. And even though you're at F4, if you keep it wide open, you should still be able to use that outdoors in low light because of how incredible the sensor is at that ISO on both of those cameras. It's it's well known that it's got that like dual native ISO. So I would definitely tell you start running it at the 12,500 where it starts cleaning up again away from noise. It almost looks like the camera resets back to zero, but you're getting all the boost in the sensor sensitivity, allowing you to capture as much light or better said, allowing you to maximize the light that you'll be getting in that scenario with that camera and that lens. So hopefully that helps out. But that's what I was gonna mention about it. It just seems to be another like, Honestly, to me, another banger lens for Sony. This, the thing that surprises me is that they did announce it today, but it will not be available till I believe June. So this is like still a couple months out. The people who got their hands on it and did the test things, they're literally the first ones to get this lens out. Um, but then when it comes to functionality of this lens, they, to me, I think they really knocked it out of the park. They, I don't think they could have fit more things on it. It has a full on aperture ring. So aperture from four to F 22 manual setup on the back side of the lens. It also has an aperture lock. So I wasn't able to see if you can lock it at any aperture. And just have it like sit there. So let's say I wanted to shoot at F8 and didn't want it to move. If I can put it there and just lock it down, that would be amazing. But I do know that it has the ability to lock. So like, let's say you do put it on, on automatic, you're able to lock it so that it doesn't move around in that aspect. I've seen other lenses. I've owned other lenses that will lock in only one position. This would be ideal if you can lock it at any aperture range, but I'm not sure because I, I didn't see anything mentioning that they just said that it has a lock, which is still pretty impressive. So right off the bat, you have an aperture ring and an aperture ring lock. Then on the other side, you're going to have your standard switch, which is like manual focus to auto focus. But then you're also going to have a custom button, which is also famous for Sony lenses. So it's a button that you can set to do anything that you like on my lenses. I usually put that for eye autofocus because while I'm holding it in my camera, especially for photography, when I want to access that feature, for a portrait, I know that I have a designated button for it, so it makes it super convenient and doesn't require me to change any other buttons in my camera setup for everyday use. Then you go to the focus ring, which is, of course, focused by wire, meaning traditionally old school lenses. Let me see. Oh, no, I put. Oh, OK, I got one. I got one. I usually I thought I put all my lenses away. This is a good way. Let me go to my overhead shot so that I can give you a better view of what's going on here. All right. Right here, I'm going to start moving the focus ring, right? And there has physical stops because this is how lenses were made back in the day. It physically has a like a gear inside of it and that the more I rotate the lens, the more it's going to extend changing the focal distance to get the right focus. So that's a hard stop. You can't move it anything past that. And then you continue here and it stops right there. Today's digital lenses work completely different, especially when it comes to focus rings. I don't think I have one here available. Oh, well, I could show you on this one. All right. 
this is a very small lens right but still it's still going to show the same purpose this focus ring right here as you can see is just going to spin on into infinity this is what we call focus by wire meaning that there's a bunch of like little linear lines kind of like a morris code and there's a sensor in there that's basically telling the elements electronically to move forward and back depending on how i rotate this once it's electrified and it has power but when it's off like this like i said it just moves into infinity and it does nothing with the actual lens because there's nothing physically attaching the focus ring to the elements inside it's all done electronically that's what we call focus by wire the reason why people prefer the older style or hard stops on a focus compared to focus by wire is because every movement in focus is going to be identical because it is a like a scale that is just linear when it comes to the focus by wire and the electronic systems if you spin it fast you're going to get a much faster focus pull if you spin it slow you're it's going to vary and if you do not have like a robotic type arm, which I don't think any of us do, and you can exactly match the exact force of rotation and speed every single time that you go to do a focus pull in, in like videography, you're going to get a different type of movement because of the electronics being read differently being that oh it felt that you spun it a little bit faster this time so it's gonna push in a little bit faster compared to the physical like hard stops on an old lens that will definitely give you the same exact focus pull time and time and time again this is where sony is trying to like really step up their game they know that their lenses do not have this physical connection like the old lenses do they know that they have a focus by wire but they're trying to put an emphasis and this is the first lens where i see that they're trying to create a system electronically that responds just like hard stops on these old lenses which is amazing on top of their latest camera the f the sony a7 IV, having a feature called um, focus breathing compensation which takes any of their standard spherical lenses and basically steps them up to cinema grade cinema grade because it is now going to give you the ability to rack focus without having focus breathing which is why people spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on these incredible lenses just because they have that capability and these are capabilities that you will see on set for movies so what sony is really doing right now is revolutionary and that's why i stay impressed with this so much because on top of all of these incremental advances when you put them all together you're coming out with a system that is going to allow you to do anything and everything that you want which is what gets me excited now. The other thing is that because this lens was not a G Master, the price is significantly less than what it would have been if it was. Because you would probably be looking at like $2,400. And with the way the chip shortages are going right now, I wouldn't doubt that this lens would be $2,600 if it were in an f2 or an f2.8 something in that range right it would be a lot bigger they wouldn't be able to add but you know i digress if it would have been a g master it would have been a lot more maybe not so much but i would say all that if it had all of these capabilities and that speed of 2.8 it would have to because just you can't have one without the other that's why i think that they went this route instead of going fast aperture and then removing a lot of these beneficial like settings and advances that they were able to implement into this lens so now who is it for i think just about everyone my favorite focal length is the 16 millimeter on 
my APS-C because it gives me a 24 millimeter look. That's what I like. I do not like the 10 to 18 on the APS-C because even though it's a crop factor multiplication thing that we're dealing with, when I go all the way out to 10 to get like a 15 or 16 millimeter look on the APS-C, I personally don't like it. I think it's a bit too fish-eyed. And when I stick the camera out, it makes my arm look like extremely elongated. And that's just something that I don't like the look of when I shoot my footage. So that's my personal preference. And when it comes to this, excuse me. When it comes to this, I think this is a, a really interesting lens, even for me, because I do believe that it's designed more for video and it's gonna give me the ability to still get a 16 millimeter wide angle on a full frame camera, which I own. But then if I wanted to use it as a vlogging lens on my APS-C cameras, it's still not so big where that it's going to be like extremely cumbersome because the length of it is just about the same size as um, like my 50 millimeter or just about the same size as my 16 millimeter um, Sigma that you're looking at right now. This one just lives on my A6100. So there's not that much of a difference, but there's a lot of, you know, um, a lot of functionality that you can gain out of this lens. Like I really don't have a need for it, but I know that I'd be able to use it if I did own it. And like I said, it's not a G Master, so it's it's being sold for like twelve hundred dollars, I believe, like nineteen ninety nine, uh, something like that. I twelve hundred dollars. I I know I probably just butchered the the price there. One thousand one hundred and ninety nine dollars roughly is what this lens is being pre-ordered for but if you are interested i did mention before you are going to have to be waiting to like june i think june 24th is when they're going to start shipping these lenses so it will be a while and you know what out of my most recent uh experience i can honestly tell you i'm not the biggest fan of waiting for things but I'll touch on that in a little bit. I've said my piece on this lens, and now I'm going to see if you guys have any questions. Like Mr. Duncan had uh, mentioned before, if you do have any questions, please put a cue in front of them so that I can get to them. I'm going to go ahead and start doing that. All right. Carlos is here saying hello to everyone. Okay, let me close this right here. Sly is also here saying hello to the fellow junkies. How are you doing, Sly? Okay, let me see. How long ago was this? Give me a time. Okay, I'm about 15 minutes behind. Not too bad. So that was about the length of my, my, my rant. Okay. It says, my buddy made fun of me for buying an old FX7. The kit lens, which was a 28 to 135 PZ power zoom. It's a beast at F4 and FX3 zoom rocker. You see? And that's what I was telling you. This is the whole thing. And if you're shooting with enough light, F4 is a great aperture. People, you know, people get caught up just like with the gear acquisition syndrome and the FOMO and all that stuff. That is a great lens. And the fact that it's the PZ and I... If I'm correct, if it's the FX7, it probably has the rocker on the lens itself. It's a bit of a chonky boy, but it's a great lens. And at the end of the day, the image that you get from your lens is the most important. So if it, look at that, it says, I do wish it had OSS like the 128, but you can't have it all right. That, and especially the older cameras. So Mario Crespi is in the house. How are you doing, sir? saying hello to me and to friends question an affordable capture card recommendation very easy i actually might even have it right here is the amazon basics usb to hdmi oh man i just had it here because i was talking about it earlier today 
I don't know what I where I put it. Let me see. I gotta find it. Nope, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I thought I had it, but hey, I digress. We march on. We march on. Um, the more traditional one that you can find. Do I have the box there? No, I don't. I put everything away. Okay, good and bad. All right. The Elgato Camlink 4K runs around $100 to $120. It's the one that I'm using right now as my main, and it does have the ability to go up to 4K 30 and pump out 4K 30, right? How you had asked before, you're talking about your ZV-1. I believe you're going to be doing 1080 video, meaning you don't need to spend the extra money for the 4K, especially if you're not going to use it. I highly recommend picking up any USB from Amazon. Um, it just type in US. Actually, you know what? Let me look it up for you and I'll leave it in the chat. Let's see. Uh, nope, I don't think that's going to happen. Where's, where's the screen? Oh, okay. It was the same one. Okay, I can do it. Let's work this out right here. Let me put up the music for a quick second. Amazon's asking me to sign in again. Wow. Okay. We're here. USB 3.0 capture card $20 okay and that's actually actually you know what that one's that one's newer and it looks nice let's take a quick look at this Okay, this one's seventeen ninety nine, and and I believe if I do this, then click here, paste. Boop. Okay, so there you go, Nano. All right, and there you have it in chat. This is why I recommend this one. It's a ten eighty out card. So no matter even if you have a 4K signal going into it, it will be able to accept the 4K signal. It just won't be able to pump out a 4K signal to your computer. It will downscale whatever signal you got and send it out at 1080. But because your camera is sending 1080, it's just a perfect match. So you plug that in, $17, and it fixes you right up. Just as long as you do have a USB cable, like an HDMI to a full-size HDMI, and you're set. That's all you're going to need, and it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg. For example, like I said, my main camera here is my um, Camlink 4K. I wanted that especially for my use case scenario whenever I set up any of my other cameras for b-roll I'm usually shooting it in 4k and wanting to have the full bandwidth and capability to record with ecamm using that is why I was seeking out the cam link 4k prior to that I was just using my standard um, USB and this one right here this one's connected with a USB card, the same one that I just sent you the link to. Um, this is my iPhone and it's taking a minute to connect. There we go. This is my iPhone. And then yet this one as well here, it, and it's tearing on me right now, but that's my computer. I could only do so much. Once I get my new computer in here, I shouldn't have that tearing issue on the line there. But that's also a USB, but like I said, that one doesn't have a USB 3.0 port available. And I'm sending this signal through an adapter. And actually, you know what? I don't know if I can show you, but 
the camera that I have here is connected to that same USB dongle or capture card from Amazon, but it's going into, oh, it's being blocked. Right here, this is a, a HDMI converter, so to speak. My HDMI signal is coming out of there. This is going directly into my Thunderbolt port, and it gives me a SD card reader and multiple USB-A. So if you can see right there under my finger, that red cable is my iPhone that you're looking at right now, and the USB connection next to it is this camera. So I am maximizing all of my ports as as of right now and I can't wait to get my new cam uh, my new computer with more IO to be able to better address all of this but we're gonna go back to it back to it so there we go oh, I appreciate it Paul yes if you do want to help me out you could always buy me some coffee the caffeine is very very helpful Sammy superstar is in the house oh we're they're staying up there. Let's go. Okay. They're they're stacking on top of each other. This is what I wanted to say. What's up, Sammy? How are you doing? I just wanted to congratulate you on a great event. I also want to thank you for letting me be a part of it. It was a lot of fun. Learned a lot, both sharing and educating myself so it was a great learning experience and i just want to thank you again you did a really really good job oh and he says thank you for speaking last night i, I didn't even see that one but it was my pleasure oh, okay he corrected me so it wasn't 20 uh 12 500 it's 12 800 but that's what i'll tell you yo just start using 12 800 as like iso 100 if, if you're going outdoors and just start there because it's going to be the cleanest that you're going to get your ISO outdoors in low light. That's just where you need to start. It's almost like that's why I find that camera so intriguing because it's like carrying two cameras. It's like having a regular camera and an extremely incredible low light camera. Right. And just instead of switching a mode, you just switch the ISO, lock it in there. Do not let it be variable start there adjust your settings accordingly and you'll begin some really good image tom beasy is in the house how are you doing sir welcome always a pleasure to have you here it says mommy guide inc hi first time on the live chat well thank you for saying hi thank you for um you know not lurking around and introducing yourself welcome to the camera junkie live stream it's a pleasure to have you here and you see automatically you got the you got the welcome from the master moderator Paul Duncan. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, that's part of my replay squad. But also just like uh, I've mentioned before if you do have any questions whether I did cover them and you just still want to know, just put a cue in front of it and I'll be happy to help. Luis Luis Lazuka is in the house saying hi Luis and uh you, well we're just checking in says I'm tempting you to join the Sony family I think you're doing good already I think you're fine and that's the whole thing you see exactly 1200 1199 to pre-order at a camera store near you yeah but that's what you know talking about the pre-order one thing that I did pre-order was my new computer. I I was saving up for the MacBook Pro and I waited on the the Apple event that happened on the 8th. And when it did, the computer that I didn't know I needed showed up and I was like, this is perfect for me. So I took the same budget that I had for my laptop to upgrade and put it into a desktop because I was basically going to use the laptop as a desktop replacement, just needing that little bit of power for my current workflow. And I was able to like more than double up the amount of performance that I was going to get in the laptop with the same amount of budget by getting the Mac studio. But that's where I said, 
it was pre-ordered and because i did adjust you know like the memory and the ram to get it to the specifications that i wanted they put a waiting list on it you know like okay well we're gonna start sending them out on the 18th but you're gonna get yours later afterwards and i was like it's fine but to see everyone just like pop open their new like computers and everything and i'm just sitting here like waiting i'm like Ooh, I didn't think it was going to be tough, but it's not that easy. So I don't know if I'd want to pre-order a, a lens that's going to like make me wait for this lens, like stocking the UPS man for like two months. I don't know about that. That's what I'm saying. Like, cause I'm over here just waiting for Apple emails to just let me know when they're going to be shipping me my computer. I'm just hypothetically, hypothetically, I should be getting it Tuesday. I'm really excited. It's just going to be a game changer. But let me remind you, if you haven't already, to please make sure that you hit the like button. There we go. And do that for me. It's highly, highly appreciated. It goes a long, long way. It says, I appreciate the very detailed way that you explain stuff. Thank you. I was talking about this earlier today in um, the gold members group with Doc Rock. It's, um, I tried to explain things like if I was speaking to my mother, right? To give it that little bit of extra TLC in the way that you would speak to a loved one and explain it to someone that is willing to learn, but sometimes has never heard a lot of these terms before so i could just rant on i remember i was on a live stream and i was like yeah so I, once i got into mirrorless cameras i stopped chimping on my camera and they had never heard that they were like chimping what is chimping and for those of you who have never heard this term before uh, i'm gonna grab another camera dslr cameras oh we're over here DSLR cameras. These are not mirrorless because they allow the light to go right through the optics into the lens. So right now I can see my entire setup through the lens just because I took off the lens cap. The thing is, after every photo that you would take, right? As soon as you would do it, you would take the camera off of your face and right away start revising that image. Re the revision of the image is what we like, what was labeled in the, the photography world as chimping. You're, you're checking your exposure, you're checking your shutter speed, motion blur, making sure that it's in focus, a lot of those details. And because the image that you would record on your camera, was different than what you're seeing through your optics because of the way that your eye works. So let's say you're in low light environment and your camera can't handle that, but your eyes have already adapted to the environment. Once you put your eye through this, your eye is seeing more than what your camera would be able to pick up. So even though you see people through the viewfinder and you're like, oh, it's not the moonlight looks great. And then you click on the shutter and you're going to get a completely underexposed image because your camera does not have the type of range that your eyes do. That's why that's the entire process of learning photography. And that simple little thing is something that I can just ease by over a simple term like chimping and have somebody like lost in a loop just because I try to explain a very complex thing with a word that's been used in the industry for years. Does that capture card output 1080 upscaled? I believe it could. Lewis, I believe it could. I'm not sure because there is no settings on the capture cards themselves. So I, I could be wrong, but there is a possibility that if your camera cannot provide 1080p and you connect a 720p connection to it, it's not going to automatically like pump out 1080. It will recognize the 720 and then come for the card itself to make sure that it's digitizing that signal so that you can use it. But at the end of the day, if you're getting 720p, right, high definition, 
that's a much better quality signal that you can get from like a lot of other cameras, whether it be webcams, so on and so forth. He goes, that's exactly what I have. That's funny. Question says, when you get your new Mac studio, will you downgrade your M1 Mac mini as a dedicated live stream computer? I, I was thinking about that exactly, like just having that, but there is certain aspects that benefit me to putting my live stream on my, alt, my new Mac studio for the reason that I do everything here. And this little issue that I was having here with the cables disconnecting and my iPhone not showing up had to do that it's sharing a connection port. So I would like to remove the additional ports out of this setup like this and then add that to the studio because each camera will now have the ability to get its own dedicated line with its own little dedicated card so that it can get the highest signal. And I have four cameras, but I am really pushing it to the max. To tell you the truth, the biggest thing for me to get the studio is not even about the live stream. And that's just being all sincere. It has to do with my editing workflow. Like I've noticed that once I get into files and I'm editing them and I'm into like 45 minutes to an hour of like the actual file. So I'm right now I'm editing, I'm repurposing live streams through my edits. And as I'm chopping them down, the actual live stream file, like my own, could be an hour and a half, two hours. So having that two hour timeline sitting on my um, editing process, it starts working fine until I get into edits past like 45 minutes. Once I'm reaching that 45 minute mark, I've added so many edits to that file that they're really starting to pile up and it's starting to like slow down my computer. And I'm even noticing the, the latency that I'm getting on my mouse cursor from like, I want to cut the file here and then chop it up to here. And as I'm scrolling the mouse, I'm getting lag latency however you want to put it so that's why i knew that my biggest like the biggest negative which is not really a negative i bought it this way is that the mac mini only has eight gigs of ram so the fact that this computer is still able to hold up these edits with only eight gigs of ram is what allowed me to know that if i had 16 or 32 i would be in a very good position. What I was able to do was jump from 32 to 64. So now I'm getting my new computer with 64 gigs of RAM, which was the most important for me when it comes to editing these larger files and adding, um, you know, like special effects to them, lower thirds, color grades, all of the things that would be memory hungry as far as the RAM goes. And now I have 64. So where I have eight and I was potentially getting my new MacBook computer with 32, which would have been four times. I am now eight timing that if I did the math correctly. And now I'm going all the way to 64 gigs on a much faster processor. So my editing workflow is should be like butter. Right. And that's what I'm hoping for. And I'm really ecstatic. I, I know it's going to do it because of this one's already handling the workload as is the new push for more content that I'm going to be producing is why I need this machine as well. So uh, I'm really excited. But the way that I go through computers, this is going to be in my possession for probably like the next eight to ten years, because that's just how often I upgrade my computers because the next one will be my macbook pro which i'm gonna hold off now because of how i have this new studio i don't have to like change that one out so fast and i'm going to have options either the new m2 series is going to come out which i might jump on that but if not as soon as that series comes out if i don't see anything that really you know tickles my fancy right for lack of a better word 
If I don't see anything that really entices me to get into that new setup, then what I'm going to do is go right back to the machines that are available now, the M1 series, maybe the MacBook Air, which I'm very comfortable with the design and will only reduce in price because a new set of computers with new processors have hit the market. So it's all, all on the up and up for me. I'm really excited. But I actually think that I was going to dedicate this more to my YouTube videos and my YouTube renders. So keep all of the business stuff on the studio and run my live streams because it is going to be my everyday computer as well, right? The other thing that could possibly like slow down my computer is having like 100 Chrome tabs open, which I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right i have a hundred like mr moderator knows oh look at this you see all of this waiting and lagging because it's switching off and it's disconnecting on my iphone these are the things that i want to stop with the new computer but mr moderator knows that there's certain times that you could be at two live streams at the same time and the way that i've done it is really running two screens and having audio from one in one ear and the other in the other so it's just different setups that i've been able to do because i also help moderate a lot of my friends streams as well and these are all different aspects of the things that we do so i have a hundred tabs open i'm also editing i'm listening to two or three live streams my podcast app is um is open in the background and all of these things are is how I use my computer and I don't know how you guys but I'm doing multiple things all at the same time and for that reason that's what will actually be my everyday use case scenario my real world scenario talking about that mr. Tyler Stallman had a great video about his Mac studio and his setup and I just had to just give him the the big uh, you know, like the big one up, you know, big thumbs up because of the simple fact that he was the only one that I heard mention like his editing scrubbing, right? Like what, like how do you flow through your file while you're actually editing, which is a use case scenario render times. That's at the end of a project. That's not where I need to save my time. I need to save my time while I'm cutting through the timeline and like i said once i start getting to these bigger files that my mouse cursor is lagging behind my actual movement that's where i need my performance boost once i've done all the edits i don't need to sit in front of the computer to render if like the great don't get me wrong great that these files are rendering super fast but even before when I was using my 2012 Mac mini with an i5 processor, I would finish an edit project and then I go render and I knew it was going to take four hours. I wasn't going to sit in front of the computer for four hours. I went to sleep and I'll say, see you tomorrow. Right? So then the next day I would check the render to make sure that it was fine. This is where the problem entails. If there was an issue with the render, right? Let's say an asset or a lower thirds didn't come through and maybe the file was missing. So instead of like it just passing over, you're getting like this bit red mark with an exclamation point in yellow saying like, you know, like your, your file is missing. That's something that is just like, you got to re-render the file, which means that now you have to wait another four hours. That's where the problem entails, right? But if you're taking a four hour file, right? Or a four hour render and now doing it in five minutes, you can literally go have a cup of coffee and check to see if the file is complete. And if it all went through, then you're good to go. And if there was an error, you're not wasting time like going to bed or going overnight and now having to wait another four hours. You literally can render the corrections in another five minutes, which is where this could save you time. But more than anything, more than rendering is how am I scrubbing through my timeline? How am I able to utilize my computer 
while I'm editing and I got music playing in the background so that I can groove out and, you know, get into a flow state with my work. That's where I, that's where. Big ups to Tyler Stallman. He knocked it out of the park. He was the only one who mentioned it. I was like, thank you for that. Oh, Lewis is saying he missed Sammy's event. It was a really good event. Sammy really did a good job. Question, did your ship date change for your computer? Like, not initially. It it did, but to my benefit. So when I first ordered my computer, it told me April 30th to... I mean, um... March 30th to April 6th. Like that was the week that I was going to get my computer because like I said, I upgraded the the RAM to 64 and to a one terabyte hard drive, solid state. I did get an email that said that it was, should be here on the 29th. So I just got it yesterday that says like it's shipped and it's gone. Like it's got a tracking number and UPS has my computer and it should be here by the 29th, which, if I'm correct, is just a couple of days from now, right? Now that we're officially Sunday, it's officially midnight. So uh, I should have it by Tuesday. And now talking about that, I do have some other news about what's going to be happening this week. So uh, let me just continue with the chat. It says, so humbled in your belief in me, I'm doing great. Of course, man. You're doing great. Listen, you just got to understand that your worst is so much better than most people's best. And that's all I can tell you. So keep at it, bro. You'll be doing fine. Says, my question is, what is your favorite focal length for vlogging versus focal length that you have in the studio? There is no difference. It's the same. This lens, the 24 millimeter focal length is my favorite i love it this is what i use um yeah i think it's wide enough there's some people who want wider right i don't and that's why i tell you even when i had that 10 to 18 millimeter lens the f4 from sony i didn't like the look that i was getting like the widest that I would have it would be like 13 millimeters. But where wherever I would set it, I go, oh, this looks good. I like this. It would be 16 millimeter. And I was like, if I'm using this lens like a 16 to 18 millimeter, I really don't need the 18 millimeter. I have my Sigma 16 millimeter F1.2 or no, sorry, F1.4 contemporary lens. This is the lens that I go to for all of my stuff. Yeah, and it's not even image stabilized. So that's the whole thing. Like I try to do my best, but for some reason, right? Here's a little pro tip as well. Like not all vlogging has to be done handheld. Right? <laughs> People forget like you could go to a park. You could have a little tripod, right? And place your camera on the table and just have a conversation to your camera and that requires zero stabilization it's just like how are you utilizing your camera right that's the biggest thing so you can use anything for vlogging and then if you really think about that you can use even 30 millimeters because if you're gonna place the camera on a tripod you could even put it a step further behind you know it's not in your hand just as long as you have good audio that's what's most important because i've mentioned it here before bad audio is unwatchable all right so it looks like lewis is heading out it says before i go did i upgrade my radio it's so crispy <laughs> thank you i did I changed some audio and I didn't want to mention it, but apparently you did. So it is making a huge difference. This is something. This is what I call addition by subtraction. So let me show you. Oh, we're over here. 
This is my channel strip, my DBX286S. This has everything in it. This has a compressor, a de-esser, an enhancer, a threshold uh, for an expander gate, and then your output. This thing is a great little piece of kit to control audio and have everything built into one channel. But having so many loops trying to fix not the best microphones or not the best audio system, especially with my my setup, because as you can see right here, right now I'm using the PodTrack P4. And this has been the reason why the audio is so crispy because I was also able to make my own microphone. And that's what last week's um, subject was about. So this is a microphone that I was able to make. And I was getting such good sound out of it that I was like, okay, this is incredible. And I was using it directly to my Zoom and bypassing this piece of kit because this was prior to my Zoom PodTrack P4. So because this was my best piece of audio kit prior to me getting this, that's where I had all my microphones connected. And then I was using this to just control all of my music and sound effects and different things like that. I never ended up leaving this on. Let me see this. Go to settings and we move this from two minutes to never. So this never shuts off. Okay, so now we have my soundboard here. And I used to send that through here. I also had the music that you're listening to right now in the background coming in through here. So this was just controlling all of my audio with the mixing. Because of new updates on Ecamm, I've been able to better control my audio and my music and mix it better through the program itself. So that eliminated that channel. So now channel three, I have it muted, no longer needed. Channel one, which is my backup microphone at the moment, which is my Rode Podcaster, uh, Rode PodMic, not Podcaster. Okay, so many, so many names in terms that was the microphone that I was using into this system, but for some reason it was giving me a hiss. So it was just earlier today that I was talking with Doc and he was telling me like, hey, I'm getting a line bleed or something like that. And I was like, I need to fix this. I just started tearing everything out and I said, I'm only going to leave what's working. And right now this microphone has zero processing. That's why I'm so marveled with this microphone and the way it sounds right now it is there's nothing it is the microphone the capsule direct see yellow cable right you see it hanging here coming directly into the console channel two set to five five on the out and that's it just sounds so good so thank you for that i appreciate it and if you missed it, check out, well, check out this week's video where I am actually putting together and editing the video of me putting this microphone together. But last week's uh, live stream was when I mentioned this microphone. So thank you. Thank you. How do I get audio this crispy? Make your own microphone. <laughs> the video will be out soon. Same thing happened to my Mac studio. I upgraded to 32 GPU. Great with multicam over 24 GPU and two terabytes. I expect mine on Monday. Congratulations. Cool, man. Tina is here. She's saying hello. Well, welcome, Tina. Thank you for stopping by. Welcome to the live stream. I started repurposing my live streams into podcasts and hopefully into three to five minutes. Oh, nice. And she's also saying hello to Tina says three to five minute video demos. Yes. That's another thing. Oh, let me make sure it comes out three to five minute videos for demos. I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm editing videos for my client, but I haven't gotten around to repurposing the videos for myself, 
But what I have been doing is cataloging everything. If you don't know, I use Ecamm. It's what allows me to do this entire process that you're seeing here from the scrolling text to the comments on the screen. Everything that you see here is powered with Ecamm. And because of it and the ability that it's given me, it's allowed me to progress a lot of these things as well. So um, one of the major things that it does is that it records my own live stream to my computer, right? So after I finish the live stream, I will have a high definition, high quality, like lossless file of everything that I've done tonight on my hard drive and it will have everything separated so it will have my microphone feed separated the music separated and the video files separated so that i am able to mix it to my heart's content in post and if there was ever a part where maybe the music was too loud on the live stream even though that's the way it's baked in to YouTube because that's the way YouTube is recording it. I still have the ability to fix it in post when I get those actual files in my hands. So those are just another reason why Ecamm is just the bomb. Yeah, just the bomb. Is this your regular stream, stream schedule? Yes, every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern is the Camera Junkie live stream. This is episode number 69, and next week will be 70 consecutive weeks without skipping a beat. So you can just mark it on your calendar, Saturday nights, 11 p.m., Club Camera Junkie. She says Epoch Cam. Yes, Epoch Cam for that camera, but the cable and the connection is why it's like lagging. <laughs> it says 100 tabs open. Wow. Not really 100, but sometimes it gets up there because I also have categories. So let me explain. If I'm working on something in particular and I'm researching something, I will literally have a Chrome window that's open with those tabs and whatever it is that I'm researching. And I will actually minimize that because I also have multiple like Gmail accounts. So each one of these browsers is corresponds to a different Gmail account. So then I have one that I do research from like my Mr. Fix It, which is my iPhone repair business that I'm slowly, you know, bringing to a halt. But whenever I do research on that or I'm checking on stats or information or information in general about that, I will have a completely different window with more tabs on that. So while some people could have Chrome running 20 tabs, I can have, in all sincerity, I can have three different Chrome windows open at the same time with about seven to 10 tabs each easily easily but that's also me always just trying to learn oh you know i'm always feeding myself i'm trying to like i don't watch a lot of things i listen to a lot of things and then when something like piques my interest i will then focus my attention to what they're showing on screen and probably rewatch it a couple of times until it sinks in says for multiple things at the same time the amount of cores are important absolutely and also the memory because the cores is one thing but these are all like single core tasks so no matter how many tabs you have what really determines the factor is the the your unified memory in this case so the way that these mac computers work is that whenever their unified memory gets filled up it starts using the onboard ssd as additional ram and it starts compressing it which is what bogs everything down right now i st do start getting you know high pressure on my memory because i'm asking it to do so many things at once and it's just not being able to handle the just the bandwidth of what I'm requiring it to do so I will run this machine and it's running anywhere from four to six gigs of memory that's being dumped into the SSD so I was saying okay if it has eight gigs and it's utilizing an extra six gigs through 
my everyday use, then I think 16 gigs would do fine. But to kind of future proof myself, let me get the 32. That's why I had that in my cart until the studio showed up. And for the same price, I was able to get 64 with one terabyte and a, and a max chip, because that's the other thing I'm going from, you know, and this is once again, nerd alert, I'm going nerdy, going from a 10 core, 14 core GPU, right? So a 10 core CPU, 14 core GPU, which is still substantial upgrade from my eight core CPU and eight core GPU that I'm using in the mini right now, that was the entry level CPU that I was going to be getting with this new studio. I've upgraded to the max chip with a 10 core CPU and a 24 core GPU, which is an added 10 cores on the GPU side, which is what I'm going to be using it most for, for my editing and stacking all of these like effects and images. And the other thing that's directly correlated with that is the memory. And I was able to upgrade to 64. So depending on everyone's use case scenario in mine, this was like a no brainer. And I was like, click send please. And that's why I just can't wait. Then the fact that it's also the same exact form factor that it's just going to look like a, a chunkier version of the computer that I have already is just fits perfectly because I myself am uh, just a chunkier version of myself when I was 20 years old, <laughs> right? We're just, we're, we're all just chunkier, more, more efficient versions of our previous selves. <laughs> okay. sounds like me. I don't really care how long the exports take exactly just you got it. You said it right. And that's the whole thing. Like th they're great, right? Because I've even experienced the, um, the additional like export times on the mini, you know, like let's say it's a five minute video that I've just edited for my YouTube. I go to export that video. It's done in, in less than a coffee break, right? It's, it's almost like real time or faster. So I can get a three minute ex like export because of the simple fact of what is my final product and nine times out of 10, I'm exporting it to MP4. So it's not like I'm asking the computer to make a really heavy or intensive codec for my final product at the end of the day. So pump that out. It takes minutes. And like I said, if there's any issue, I can re-render it. I do know the difference, but for me, the, the power that I'm going to gain from this computer is not in the render times. You know, it's not in benchmarks that people are going to say like, D can you play Tomb Raider? Like, no. And, and this is another thing. Like anyone says like, oh, who games on Mac? I do. I game on Mac, but am I gaming the games that you play? No, that's the whole different thing. How am I gaming on Mac? Let me see. Can I do a screen share? I don't think I. L let me see if I figure this out. But anyways, what I do have is called an emulator. So I have this little icon on the bottom of my computer here that looks like an old school Atari or ColecoVision controller. And when I open up the application, it has a list and I mean a list of all of my favorite old school console games. So it has Neo Geo, it has Super Nintendo, Nintendo, Sega Genesis. Uh, uh, it's got all of them built in. And the only thing that I have to do is download an equivalent ROM to any game that I own, you know, and this is just so that you could understand the legal matter. I am just downloading a copy of a game that I own already. So I'll come out here and I'll bust out a cartridge for my Nintendo 64 Mario Kart, right? That's a game that I own that I have the console sitting right there. And if I wanted to, I could set it all up, but that's inconvenient to me. So I have this little emulator that now has that game downloaded directly to my computer, giving me the ability to play it on my Mac computer. And it looks a lot better and runs way more efficient on my computer than it ever will on the actual console. The only difference is that I'm not using the old school Nintendo 64 controller, which is, you know, in sincerity, not my favorite. So what do I do? Let me, let me go grab it so I can show you.
So I have this guy right here. This is my Steel Series controller. It connects and it's designed for iOS devices. This one actually, the charging port is the lightning cable. So I charge it with the same cable that I would use for my iPhone. Um, and it's connected Bluetooth. So I connect it to it and whenever I feel like playing an old school game, and I really mean like an old school game, like what games would I play? The games that I played when I was a kid, like you're talking about Pokemon. Pokemon is not a graphic intensive game. But if I ever want to feel nostalgic, I'll throw that on there and kill an hour and it would be like, that was fun. You know, just brings you back to your, to the old school days. So it just depends. So who, who, who games on Mac? I do, but I emulate. So there you go. Says I would vlog with either Sony 16 to 55 F 2.8. That one's a great lens, but on my a6600 great combination and for those of you who don't know the reason why that's a great combination is because sony's 16 to 55 g lens f 2.8 is not image stabilized so all the little jitters that we were just talking about about vlogging if you do want to do it handheld okay will be present when you use this lens on all cameras that sony has in their aps-c line except the a6500 and the a6600 both of those cameras have image stabilization or as sony calls it steady shot inside of that camera so it now becomes a image stabilized system when you're using that lens with the 65 or the 6600 so the zeiss 16 to 35 f4 oss on my fx3 which i prefer oh you see And that's the 16 that's the zeiss hmm and you know what i i this is the funny thing like i find that funny because i've heard so many like bad reviews about that lens right the 16 to 35 the zeiss and i've heard the same thing of my 24 to 70 the zeiss it's an f4 image stabilized or oss optically stabilized and it's it gives me great images and when people are saying like yeah but when i want to shoot landscapes and i want that edge to edge sharpness there's a little fuzziness on the edge i'm like okay that's for that use case scenario but that doesn't make it a bad lens it just doesn't so at the end of the day it's your use case scenario i found that these lenses actually work very well i bought that lens with the thought of selling it Right. I bought it, you know, as like a kit. I got a good deal. And then I just started parting everything off so that I can make my money back. Right. Got to think smart. Lenses I bought in the kit that I already owned. I had two of them, didn't need two of them. So I sold them off again. But this one, I didn't really think that I was going to keep at all. I had all plans, all intent to sell this lens. And then I just started using it more and more and more. And then the next thing you know, I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to sell my other kit lens. And I ended up making less money out of the transaction. But I was very happy with the final results because I'm very happy with that lens. It says, looking forward to that. Make your own mic. Yeah, this microphone that you're listening to right now that you're seeing here, I made from scratch the video will be coming out either wednesday or thursday i'm finishing it up right now i wanted to have it finished for this week but i did make a um the 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 event for sammy that was something that was important to me I, he had asked me long time ago and i knew that i was just there's no way I could miss that. So all of my energies and efforts were set up for that. That was very successful. And I'm just very happy that it all went well because it did go well. So it says, wow, really? Epoch Cam could do all that? No, Ecam. Ecam can do all that. Epoch Cam, just to be clear, let's see where we're at here. Epoch cam is what I'm using to connect this camera. This is the only camera that's not using an HDMI because this is my iPhone X or XR. Yeah, it's an iPhone XR. 
so i'm just using like the wide lens and i have it hanging from above to give kind of like this overhead shot this one is my a5100 actually marga's and i gotta send it out to her so i gotta replace this camera soon because this is an image this setup right here this is something that i need to have in my life all the time so this is my second a6100 this is my 30 millimeter on the sigma and this is the sigma 16 millimeter on the same or on another but same a6100 let me see here there we go that was a bit of a slow song so i just skipped it to the next one this one this one should be much better says cuz uh perfect because it's 11 a.m sunday here in the philippines i believe that's what that is oh highly appreciated thank you and let me be the first to welcome you to the camera junkie crew <laughs> melanie how are you doing says hi everyone i'm late you're not late you made it on time i'm i'm the one who's late it says 70 weeks that's incredible thank you sir i appreciate it I am so happy to help, and whenever you have a question, feel free to reach out to me. So, did I get the uh, base model M1? I did. When I when I bought the M Mini, right, the Mac Mini M1, I literally bought the entry level just to see if it will work for me. You know, I everyone was saying like, "Oh, it's such an upgrade." I was like, "Let's see," because, like I said, I also have a very, very big and powerful PC right here that has 64 gigs ram dual 1080 gx or gt cards uh this thing is a beast right but i wanted to see like can this little 600 dollars machine outbeat it and i do say 600 for the pro tip i bought my mac mini m1 from the refurbished side of apple so it wasn't even a brand new one. Somebody returned it because I guess they didn't feel it was enough for them. And then I bought it for like a hundred dollars less than that. I paid five eighty nine instead of six ninety nine. So a little bit over a hundred dollars off. And tax in total, I think I paid six hundred and thirty dollars for it. It came in the same exact box as a traditional Mac Mini. And the only difference was that printed on top of it literally said refurbished. Like like if it was a stigma that they wanted to put on the box. I'm like, I don't care. Once it's on my desk, nobody can tell the difference. And it's outperformed two Mac Minis that I had together. And I stopped using both of those computers entirely. And now I've been doing everything on this one. So so far so good and then it has allowed me to actually start establishing my own uh, video editing freelancing and establishing my production company which is why i also invested in this new machine because i also know that i'm going to be taking on bigger projects and it's only going to get more and more taxing on my computer from here on out so that's why like i said before i had the other macbook in my cart already because i was already waiting for the upgrade but then when this one came along it was like perfect for me so i'm ecstatic it says plus he's a sony guy yeah but sony but then i'm a camera junkie so i do shoot sony that's my preferred but i'm also familiar with nikon uh, and this guy over here this is my Fuji, my X-T1, and then up there, I have some of my film cameras. Oh, this is my new wall as well. I was doing some cleaning, and um, I was going through all my game controllers, like this one, right? And I decided to mount them up there. So we have PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4 controller, then we go to a PSP, PS Vita, this one underneath it there. I'm doing a pretty good job with this. Okay, this one that I'm pointing at right here, this is another one of these Steel Series controllers, right? The same brand, but that's the Android version. So that's like the Windows version via USB. 
and then that one right there that is an Xbox 360 and underneath it is an Xbox one the original series one not the one s or one X or anything just my old Xbox series one so and then that thing right here you know what I never mentioned that to you guys let me show you this This is a project that I had been wanting to do for a long time and I actually just did it. So right off the bat, what I did was I bought a shelf. So you see, I bought a shelf. This is a $10 shelf from Walmart. And what I did was I deconstructed my desktop computer that was the computer that I first used for my first live stream here on this channel um which was we're going back to december 2019 right so december 2019 i believe right or no december 2020 i think it was i'm, I'm getting all my dates mixed up but this was my first desktop computer and i reconstructed it and put it there working so on top we have my motherboard with my XFX R7700 series, my Ghost. This is my video card. As you can see, everything is connected there. All the I.O. Oh, we got a little dust going on there. Okay. My Thermal Take heat sink, 24 gigs of RAM. I totally dressed it up so that it sits here on this board. And now this is basically my shelf PC. It's completely functional and it works perfect. I have plans on actually mounting it upside down, maybe like so, so that I can still utilize the shelf, but still have it there. As of right now, I just have it up as decoration, as a reminder of 70 live streams, right? And going. So that's that. And then this spot right here, right? This spot, that's for my plaque. But that's in the future. That's that's after I get plaqued. <laughs> it says, thanks for your time and tips. Happy to help. It says, I am chunkier. Not sure about the more efficient part. <laughs> I love it. All right, so we got people saying hello. John stopped in. He's saying hello. Late, but he's checking in. Thank you for stopping by, John. He says, oh, sorry. Okay, so just as long as we're on the same page, because there are a lot of things, and Epoch Cam is something that if you were to search on the internet, you would find it. So Epoch Cam is just a program. I paid $8 from it from Elgato. It's a software that you install on your computer and then an app that you have on your phone. With Ecamm, just to address this, with Ecamm, you can connect your iPhone directly to it and it will recognize it. And if you were to open up your camera application, it will then start feeding you everything that's being shown on your camera. The problem is that it will show you everything, including like all the information that you are normally seeing as the photographer behind, but doesn't get like implemented into the final, like the final file on your phone. When you're using it as an external source and you're using the native camera, you will see everything that's being displayed on your phone. So if you want to display text messages, it's really cool because you just have to plug in your phone and you can use it as a source and you can literally show anything that you would be able to see on your phone like it is your phone on stream through Ecamm. But the Epoch Cam just gives you a clean camera source 
with now without any of the information on there allowing it to connect directly to the computer and then when your ecam recognizes it and is able to synchronize the image is going to give you a clean image so that it let's see okay that did not go oh we're skipping a step what happened here Okay, we, we lost everything there. Okay, this one here. So just to get this image, this is now being sent through Epoch Cam and just directly into a USB port. Okay. It says, question, do you have, do you know a hack to get clean HDMI out of the A5000? I want to use it for my live streams or iPhone, but can't. No, sorry, bro. The A5000 the A does not have clean HDMI at all. It just doesn't. But there is something that you might be able to do. It just depends on if you're able to live with the quality that you're getting. Because the A5100 is going to send what we call a dirty HDMI signal. Meaning it's going to have all the extra information on it. What you can do is take off that information from the menu, right? So just like the iPhone, anything that's going to be displayed on the back of the LCD will be transferred to the signal on the A5000. This one that I have overhead is the 5100. And basically the only difference between those two cameras is that this one has clean HDMI. It's almost like the Canon Mark one, Mark two on the M fifties. Like the only real big difference is that there was another difference that I believe the a, the a 5,000 is a 16.1 megapixel sensor, right? Which is the same, like off of my, um, NEX six. And this one is already upgraded to the 24.2 megapixel sensor that you find on the A6000, A6100, so on and so forth. So this is the one that steps up to it, giving you the clean HDMI. The A5000, if I am correct, is still on that older sensor. And it has nothing to do with the sensor, but just they didn't implement it into the camera. So when they made the upgrade with the sensor to this one, they made sure that they implemented the clean HDMI. But going back to it, how do you hack it? Well, with Ecamm, you can hack it a little bit. Let me see if I can do this. Okay, I'm in live demo mode. No, 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 we're gonna install later. Hopefully you guys can hear me fine. I don't know why it was asking me that, but we'll, I digress, we're gonna continue. You should be seeing what I'm seeing. This is what we can do. So let me go here, here. Okay, I'm on my overhead. So now I could adjust this camera and you can still see it. You're seeing everything that I'm that that I'm seeing on my screen, but you're able to see me within the shot as well. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna go into the camera settings and you're gonna click on this little guy right here. So you see I'm on the USB video. You're going to click on zoom and pan. Oh, I have it locked right now, so it's not going to allow me to, but I'm still showing you what you would need to do. So you would click on zoom and pan and you would zoom in a little bit, right? To crop in on your actual image. It will degrade the quality of the video, right? On the a 5,000, but it will allow you to like section off a portion of the image that doesn't have anything written on there. The other thing is to actually maximize the amount of space that you have before you apply this crop here, sort of speak in post, what you would do is you would actually just set it up um, in, in the menu settings and you just go into display and you just turn off all information. So like if you were using the camera and you wanted to use it for video or for photography, make sure that you have everything turned off, which is uh, available through the camera. There's going to be certain things that just will never remove from the image. And that's where I would go into the zoom feature here in Ecamm and just like crop that out. 
You know, like let's say there was something funky popping out from the bottom, right? That's just something that was just like written here or better said right here, right? Something written right here that you couldn't get out. You would literally just crop in and zoom that part out and then you're getting the cleanest signal that you can with the gear that you own already. Oh, Kevin made it. So I'm late. Yeah, we're getting close to two hours hours he's saying yep made it before the end thank you for stopping by kevin i really do appreciate it i do hope that you enjoyed your meal with i believe it was your sister-in-law that was stopping by so i really do hope that you had a great night and the boss man is saying make sure that you hit the like button please do that if you haven't done so already i really do appreciate it okay it says, got you on the zoom in pan. I will have to give my, uh, to dedicate a cam link because it runs through my ATEM mini. Yes, that's what you would have to do definitely. But it's a 5,000. So you don't need to get a cam link. Just like I was speaking to Nano before, it doesn't, it's not even gonna provide a 4K signal out. The most would be 1080. So you can get a less expensive Amazon USB capture card for around $20 to get you the same exact like results. If you want to match color, then I would tell you, yes, go ahead and get the cam link, but it's usually about a hundred dollars more than the other one. And with Ecamm in the same settings with the pan and zoom, you could adjust your color temperatures. So that's something that could be done as well so that it could kind of like help you bypass if you do find the colors from the less expensive capture card to be funky, which this is a $20 capture card. And I've had it for 70 consecutive weeks. <laughs> this is this is what I started with right here. So I can't knock it. But I do want to appreciate every single one of you who has hung out with me this far. We're getting close to two hours and you guys are amazing to sit here and make my night every Saturday night. I'm so happy to have such an amazing community here and it's just going to get bigger and bigger, which is just gets me even more and more pumped for the, the potential of what we're building here so as always thank you for taking the time your most precious commodity and spending it here with me in club camera junkie i want to wish you all an amazing following week take care of yourselves because we're going to be doing it all over again next week we're going to be doing the same time same place and we're going to have a lot of fun oh there were so many things aiden what's going on papi Aiden's literally calling it quits for me, but there's so many things. This Wednesday, I'm like trying, look, there's still Cities Gaw. I didn't even do this. Cities Gaw, channels that I think you should go and watch. Right off the bat, let me just go to it. Aiden, please. Okay, give me one second. I see what he, why he's whining. Okay, City's Gaw. Channels that I think you should go and watch. Can't leave it out. Tomorrow, I am most likely going to be in Professor Nez's live stream. He's going to host it at, I believe it's 9.30 Pacific Standard Time, which is 12.30 uh, Eastern. He usually has a live stream for about an hour, hour and a half. He helps you learn how to monetize uh, on the platform YouTube. So if you're a content creator who's looking to figure out different ways to monetize before you're ever admitted into the YouTube partner program, like different things like you're seeing right here, the buy me a coffee is just a lot of different avenues and ways that you can help yourself continue in the creative journey by giving your your family your crew your people the ability to bless you in that way so professor nez also he helps you with a lot of like mental help he's he's just really cool i was lucky enough to meet him in a chat room 
on Clubhouse around the same time, January 2021. So um, it's, I've been in his live stream just ever since and just a channel that, like I said, I think you should go and watch. So shout out to Professor Nez. I'll be in his live stream tomorrow, most likely. So if you want, you'll probably see me there. With that being said, um, I did want to mention what I was going to be doing this week. On top of all the things that I'm trying to take care of, I am going to be heading out this Wednesday, the 30th for a meetup with Dancy Bearded and the Bearded community and all the people there. So it's a meetup in Disney Springs in Orlando. It's about a three hour drive for me. So my plans are to leave in the afternoon, hit up the meetup for the evening and then just rent a hotel, spend the night and take the drive the morning after just to make things easier for me and Aiden. But I'm really excited as this is like a creator meetup as well. So uh, plus it's Dan C. Like it's just something about Dan C. Bearded that ever since I was able to when when I was made aware of Dan C. Bearded um, uh, is just a really cool guy. We hit it off and like liking a lot of the same things he's been in the live stream here plenty of times you guys i've seen him so uh just a really really cool guy and i'm really gonna get i'm like super excited to be able to meet him in person including the mayor his wife and a lot of other people within that community which are also just another group of like really really great individuals that's why i absolutely love this platform so i'm excited for that there's a lot of other things so on top of me taking that trip still expect a video for this week about this microphone and how i put it together and what i did because it wasn't that hard but my unsure sm 57 v vega edition and uh, that video will be coming out this week once again, as a Puerto Rican, taking way too long to say goodbye. Thank you again for hanging out, everyone. So, uh, yes, Melanie's saying yes, the meetup with Dan C. Ah, that's right, Melanie. I think you said that you were going to try to make it. I don't know if you could, but it would also be a pleasure to meet you there, you know, in the real life, in the IRL. So, as always, guys, I appreciate you more than you know. Okay, so take care of yourselves and each other. I will see you all next week. So talk to you.